myself and Rochelle, who you'll meet in a few minutes here, and a few other people in the room are, um, we've participated in the League of American Orchestras Diversity Forum, and we're members of the Institutional Readiness Task Force. And the Institutional Readiness Task Force is charged with exploring how orchestra culture help and or hinder diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, and what st steps can be taken to develop highly supportive culture. So our task force thought sponsoring this session would not only be a good way to share out to the field some of what we've been doing and what we've been thinking and wrestling with in this work, but it would also be an excellent and tremendous opportunity for us to hear from the Sphinx Connect community and let that inform our work. Um, so before we meet our panel, we have um, a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, first, in keeping with our desire to hear from the room, we're gonna have two question and answer periods. And uh, with that, though, I'm going to ask for your help and understanding uh, when we need to move on from our first question period to get back to hearing from the panel again. And uh, second, as I'm uh, in a room full of musicians, I'm going to ask you uh, figuratively or uh, literally to take out your pencils and mark something that we missed in the title of our session, which is this, a question mark, because that's the more apt description of what we're doing here. We're not offering a prescription necessarily for orchestras as much as we're exploring the question. You know, can orchestras be inclusive? And what would that look like and what would it take? So leading up to today, uh, the panelists have had some great conversation. And I can tell you it was both stimulating and a privilege to hear them and to try to record it and capture it. And uh, as you can see from this graphic, uh, we covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Um, and we don't have a lot of time, so we're not going to be able to cover everything on our map. But our conversation looked at orchestras from two perspectives. We looked at orchestras inside looking in, and that is to say, looking at orchestras as it relates to inclusion from the perspective of those already inside working for orchestras. And we looked at it from outside looking in, looking at orchestras as it relates to inclusion from the perspective of the communities made up of people and organizations that orchestras live in. So that's how we've organized our session today. We're gonna look at these two different perspectives and have a question and answer period after each one. And one last bit of housekeeping, we thought it would be important to share some definitions of, of terms that came up in our conversation. So here's how we define them for ourselves. We said that diversity equals representation, right, of identities. And a ground rule that we had for our conversation that maybe we'll carry through to today here is that we um, tried to identify what we mean, who we're talking about when we say diversity. So exactly what populations are we talking about when we use this term? Uh, we took inclusion to be the practice by which diversity shows up in process. So if the metaphor for diversity is having people in the room, inclusion is having the food they eat, the way they live, show up in the processes. Uh, of the organization. And lastly, equity, we saw that as relating to power, resources, and authority. Who has them, who controls them, and how did they get them? So that's how we're using these terms today. And with that, uh, let's meet our panel. So if you guys could just take a couple minutes to introduce yourself. Weston, why don't you start? Sure, I'm Weston Sprott. I'm a trombonist with the Metropolitan Opera, and also head the brass department at Manus and teach at some other uh, New York area institutions. Um, I'm Rochelle Skolnick. I'm director of symphonic services for the American Federation of Musicians. That means basically that uh, my department provides support and assistance to symphony orchestra musicians in AFM represented bargaining units and their local unions all over the country. I'm also a violinist. I, I worked for 15 years as a professional musician. Um, and then I practiced law for 10 years in St. Louis uh, representing labor unions of all different kinds. And I'm delighted to be here. I'm, I'm really thrilled, yeah. Um, my name is Justin Lang. I uh, have a, a company in Pittsburgh called Halumbo, and I do a variety of things around planning um, with foundations or arts organizations, um, a fair amount on dealing with racism, uh, diversity and inclusion, um, yeah. My name is Anna Kuwabara. I'm the executive director of the Albany Symphony in upstate New York, uh, and before that, at the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra as their VP of uh, Orchestra Operations and Facilities. I also just want to mention that I do have education in my background, which does color my perspective. I'm not just all about orchestra management. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so for this first section, Inside Looking In, uh, we used as a jumping off point for our conversation what we thought was a, an interesting phenomenon or coexistence. So starting about 50 years ago now, orchestras began introducing the screen into their audition process. And that led to a significant increase in the number of women in orchestras. 
And at the same time, uh, today, in 2018, orchestras have at least their share of hashtag Me Too stories. And we thought that that illustrated how diversity and inclusion are not the same thing, and that you can have diversity without inclusion. Um, and while the screen may have brought some measure of gender diversity, it hasn't necessarily been accompanied by inclusion. So inside looking in, um, the questions that we wrestled with is, are, are, are orchestras inclusive and can they be? And, and Rochelle, why don't, why don't you start us off? Okay, so I, I think before I get into sort of the meat of, of my answer to that, I'd like to throw out a couple of caveats. And some of this is based on the conversations that I've had here over the past couple of days. And the, the first is that, you know, we're talking about orchestras and we've, we've sort of asked a, an umbrella question about orchestras. But I think it's important to, to remember that they're not monolithic, that orchestras are not monolithic, and that the problems facing them um, can't necessarily be generated and implemented from above by either, say, the League of American Orchestras or the American Federation of Musicians. The truth is that what we've come to think of as industry standards for our orchestra uh, world have developed over many generations and only have come to be industry standards because they were bargained and adopted uh, one orchestra at a time by the musicians working in those orchestras and by their administrations and boards. And while we do in fact have certain industry standards that are um, fairly uniform, so for example the two and a half hour service, um, there's still an incredible amount of variation among orchestras with regard to other fundam fundamental um, aspects of orchestral life like, for example, the details of the tenure process and how someone travels from probationary to tenured status. Um, the second caveat is that I think, and this I think emerged in some of our conversations, is that it's really hard to talk about inclusion when there's such a paucity of diversity in our orchestras, at least when it comes to black and Latinx musicians. Um, and you know, I think no conversation about inclusion can begin without first acknowledging that we have not yet succeeded in sufficiently diversifying our orchestras. But acknowledging that, I think we can still have a constructive conversation about inclusion starting where we are today and in the spirit of the kind of incrementalism that Afa referred to in her opening remarks, using the existing diversity we have within our orchestras. Now, we do have certain kinds of diversity, right? We have diversity of gender, thanks largely, again, to the screen, which was an advancement that was bargained within our individual orchestras by AFM local unions. Um, we have generational diversity. We have differently abled musicians, and we have diversity of sexual orientation. We have diversity of national origin and even a certain amount of racial diversity, especially with regard to Asian American musicians. It's not enough, right? It's not, but it's not nothing either. So my answer to the question of whether orchestras can be inclusive is yes, I think they can. Are they? No, not inclusive enough. But I'm a problem solver. And so for me, the more interesting question, and I'm gonna sort of turn this a little bit is, how can we go about making orchestras more inclusive? And I think the, the key to that inquiry is taking our orchestras as we find them right now and building upon that. So what happens if we take uh, the various diversities that exist right now within our orchestras while acknowledging that they're insufficient and use those as a kind of laboratory to learn more about what it takes to create a truly inclusive culture? So, you know, how much do we really know as white musicians, for example, about what our Asian American colleagues experience as members of our orchestras. How much do our youngest musicians, for example, know about the experiences of their older colleagues and about the battles that they waged to attain current wages and working conditions? How much do musicians who were born and raised here in the US understand about the experiences of our immigrant colleagues? And I, I think all of this ends up being about empathy. So how much can we use the diversity that we have within our orchestras to train ourselves in becoming more empathetic? Um, no, our orchestras are not sufficiently diverse and they're not sufficiently inclusive, but I really believe that we can leverage the diversity we do have 
to challenge ourselves as orchestra musicians, administrators, and board members to create a more inclusive space right now and to prepare a space that welcomes the even more diverse um, populations that we're working now with great intention to bring into our institutions. Anna, do you want to take a stab at this? Yeah, I'm going to bring this, take this to a more granular perspective, and it's going to be all about me and my perspective. But um, as I've been thinking about this topic after our, our conversation that really sort of blew the top of my, my head off, um, I'm thinking about inclusiveness, inclusion as in three buckets. So cultural, kind of a cultural spirit uh, aspect. So for example, when you first walk into your, your, your first rehearsal as in your new orchestra, and you feel immediately at home. You're not meant to feel that way. There's quantitative issue, their quantitative bucket, which is what tangible supports and structures are there to care for the individual, what training, what things are the, is the institution doing. And then the last bucket for me is symbolic, which is the meaning and the impact of what we say and what we do. And I'm gonna focus, for, for my, my piece, I'm gonna focus on the symbolic as an administrator. And I also am pulling from some threads of the experience that I've had over these couple of days. First, the National Alliance for Audition Support, really exciting idea, and Rochelle talking about the challenges of changing the audition process. Also, at Aaron's keynote, excellence and diversity coexisting, and I want to riff off of that and just say coexist, the coexistence of excellence and inclusivity. And for a new paradigm for auditions and to move towards a more inclusive orchestra, I feel, and I feel like a little bit, that I'm going, there's something in me that makes me feel like I'm missing something or I'm going to offend someone, but I do feel that we need to expand the definition of excellence to include more than how well do I play the violin. I think it needs to include things like emotional intelligence, leadership, team building, nurturing. I mean, there's so many ways that people can be excellent beyond how well do you play. And uh, <laughs> uh, as an administrator, I can say that the decisions and actions that I have made and I make really depend on my organization's construct of what is excellence. And so I will give you an example, um, and it, but it's something that if you, you guys who are orchestra administrators and, and work for the union and work on orchestra committees will, will recognize um, and it's a little reductive, but I'm just gonna put this out there. I'll give you the example of bad behavior and maybe even abusive behavior from a visiting artist or an orchestra musician. But that person is also an amazing artist. They're a beautiful player, the beautiful musician, and when they play, the people are moved, the audience is moved, the, their colleagues are moved. But how and what I do to address that behavior, the bad behavior, does influence very tangibly whether the orchestra is inclusive or not. And I just wanna say that my track record, I feel that I've maybe moved the needle a little bit, but not enough. And I feel like either I play or someone in the situation plays the artistic excellence card. We'll put that out there. Mm -hmm. Weston, what, what, what thoughts do you have? Um, well, the question was, can orchestras be more inclusive? And I think the answer is, yeah, they could be. They could be. Um, whether or not they actually will be or not, I think, is definitely to be determined. And um, Alex and I and a few of, of our uh, like-minded friends have been out for the past several years kind of pounding the pavement and having different, whether it's panel discussions or task forces or whatever you want to call it, any number of things that, as you mentioned, kind of begin the conversation. And we come up with all these different ideas or we present all these different ideas in what I found is interesting is that the more you get involved in these works, you start getting an opportunity to look back in history and see what's been talked about before. And so, as some of you may know and some of you may not, there was a 1993 uh, study by, that was co-sponsored by the American Symphony Orchestra League, Pew Charitable Trust, uh, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, I believe. And what's interesting is when you go back and look at all those findings, all the things that they're saying are all the things that we're saying. They said them all 25 years ago. Um, and so I don't think that the disparity between where we want to be and where we are is necessarily in a lack of ideas. The ideas are, are there. Uh, they're there now, they were there before, and I bet for those people who did it 25 years ago, there's people with the same ideas 25 years before that. So the question is not 
do we have a good enough set of ideas? Do we need to expand the definition of what it means to be a great orchestra musician to not only be able to play your standard excerpts and concertos really well, but to also be qualified to speak eloquently and be involved with educational outreach and things like that? Uh, should we have training and development for orchestra musicians so that, so that the day that you join the orchestra is not the day that you cease to develop as, um, as a professional? Sure, we should have those things. But I think what we need to dig into even deeper is is budget, because there's that old saying that you'll show me what you value when I see when I see your budget. Uh, and if we look, if we look at what what orchestras spend their money on, I bet if you look at the top 50 orchestras in America and say where exactly does diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion work fall on your spreadsheet, um, I can guarantee you it's not at the top. And I would be willing to venture that it might not even be there at all for a lot of them. So. Um, I would encourage all of us just to continue to try to do your best to speak truth to power and say, if you want to be serious about this, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Um, I, I guess um, this is the inside looking in, but I've <clears throat> never spent a day inside an orchestra, so. Um, <laughs> but I guess I would say to me, obviously the answer is no, orchestras are not inclusive. Um, it seems to me there, that the model is exclusivity. You know, you have to go through amazing auditions to get in. Um, the, the, the brand of being able to speak the language of it. All these things to me, as someone who has only observed my brother over time, is, a, is, a, is, a, um, is an othering piece. I, I, I resisted orchestras uh, from the time we were teenagers, actually, and literally fought over instruments um, because I found it so, uh, so so difficult to be myself with the idea of even being an orchestra or, or near them. So I, I, I don't think they're inclusive. I think that's the reason for Sphinx. I think the, thing, the question for me is, um, why aren't they inclusive? Um, and you know, I used to work for a foundation, and the orchestras in our arts community in general, my background was in a different part of the arts world, was of, of Capoeira and such, um, was that the orchestras were really aligned with like capital. Like they're really, the, 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 not the community orchestras, but the central one, the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra had a wholly different relationship with the very, very wealthy of our community. Um, and I think there's something about, um, you know, in capitalism, there's a notion of like enclosures, you know, things that you, you sequester off from other people. Um, and that was a movement to like make public property private. And I think there's something related to making public property private and whiteness, making the good of humanity sequestered to a certain set of people. And I think that has something to do with the relationship of why even people who are trying to participate in the culture still can't get in. That, that to me is amazing. Like you have people who are desperately trying to endorse the culture who don't look like European people and still have resistance. You couldn't, that, that shows you I think the illogicness of like white supremacy honestly. Um, even when someone wants to say it's wonderful, it still says, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, those are my thoughts. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a good time. Let's ask some questions. And uh, I've got some questions here. So there are some mics. And uh, let's, let me see. So there's one question right off the bat that's important, right? So it, it notes that there are no black women on this panel. And the question is, is how we decided who is on the panel. And I, uh, so I, I think one, uh, we, we uh, as a panel, uh, are not as diverse as we could be, obviously along that line. And uh, who decided, in part I did, and uh, uh, I decided to put my brother on the panel because uh, I think he's brilliant and I wanted a chance to share the stage with him. So that's one that I'll own as sort of being a little bit of nepotism, but hopefully it'll be for the good of the room. But I encourage that if there are black women in the room who feel comfortable and want to speak anything, please bring your voice to the conversation um, as soon as you can. Is there someone who has a question at a microphone? Am I seeing that? Yeah. surrounding um, the orchestra as an institution because um, you know I see it I perceive it as uh, inclusive yet exclusive so internally it's inclusive in the sense that you know uh, we want to be more diverse and you know we would like my more minorities uh, involved in the industry and seeing them on the stage but I would say it's exclusive in the sense of like we don't want to go to their communities and market in their communities or, you know, low-income areas, like, or even um, 
I mean, let's see. You know, just growing up, like just notions about classical music. I mean, I remember, you know, as I was uh, coming up as a music musician, it was always like, um, oh yeah, this is a really high art. This is like the greatest art out there. And, you know, just knowing that, you know, this is, this is European music, you know, sometimes um, it can come across as elitist to, to people who may not know classical music. And they say that, oh, well, this is, this is like the music that makes your baby smarter. And why is this music so pure? And, and you know, why is it better than, than the music of other cultures? Mm -hmm. So we're going to take, I'm gonna, I think we're going to have a response to that. Uh, let's take, let me read through some of these questions here, then we'll take this question at the mic, then the panel will respond to what we heard here. So we had, I gave the first question. Um, there's a question about, uh, do we think that diversity fellowships will truly make orchestras inclusive? Uh, do we need to re-strategize diversity fellowships for true inclusivity? There's a question about, that refers to um, there being a lot of elitism in classical music, and to increase inclusion and diversity, should we change the definition of classical music? So maybe depart from this aesthetic concept. Um, what can administrators do to dismantle white supremacist patriarchal systems within the orchestra world? What can musicians do? What can audiences do? And then this is an interesting one. How close are we getting into non-objective territory? White supremacy in classical music is only a segment of a larger problem after all. So let this percolate and let's get this question here and then we'll get some responses from our panel. My name is Eun Lee. I work with the Orchestra of St. Luke's and also the Dream Unfinished, which is an activist orchestra. And my question is more specifically geared towards uh, Weston and Alex. And it's, you know, being the musicians in the orchestra and not the administrators that are like making these big decisions. Have you felt like being so outspoken has put you at risk? Mm. Yes, please. Maybe, but I don't care. Um, so that's, that's, I mean, that's, you know, the thing, the thing is, you made this mention about orchestras are inclusive from within. I, I would disagree with that, having been in orchestra for a long time. Um, that's not the case. But I think, you know, Alex and I have the benefit of being tenured musicians in an orchestra, which is about as, in the bigger picture, as protected of a position as you can, you can be in. And I think if, if people who are in our positions at the moment don't feel like we can grab the microphone, for lack of a better term, and say what we think, then who's going to do it? You know, we, we, kind, of, we kind of have to. Because um, other people don't have the, the safety of the position that we have. And they're looking to us to actually make a statement on their behalf and say something that's going to be, going to be helpful to them. Um, so is it, is it risky? Um, a little bit, you know, in some ways. But I also think the question is, is whether or not it can be effective. And the problem is, you, you, well, one of the things you alluded to is that when we speak to people in power, and one of the things that needs to hopefully change is that the faces of some of the people who are in power need to change. And one of the issues that we have with power is that no people who are in positions of power relinquish that power voluntarily because they recognize that it's the morally correct thing to do. That's never happened in any course of history, ever. You know? And, and um, if I can invoke one of my fellow New Yorkers, you know, Malcolm X, he's, you know, people, People like to have us here for these different discussions and ask us what we think, and then they want to go and take the lead and run with whatever it is that we thought would be the correct thing to do. Malcolm X said, he said, um, he said, I'm always skeptical of white people who say they want to help blacks, but they have to be the people in positions of leadership. He said, if you really want to be a white person who helps the blacks, give a Negro some advice and then stand on the side. So, I'm still, I think a lot of us are still waiting for the real deal and to see which people who are in authority at the present will have the courage, the vision, and the humility to actually let someone, like Alex, for example, take the reins and run the show, because they should. Uh, so the, the, the answer to the question, uh, personally, yeah, I, I, I have felt some, um, some uh, fragility or danger, but I, I, I came to realize that it was a learned behavior. Right? I've been in this environment my whole life. Um, and uh, one of the places I learned that this was learned behaviors was after I uh, went to the Gateways Music Festival, right? And so playing the horn is playing the horn. It doesn't get easier or it's hard for me wherever I am, right? That's like, so you're playing and it's Beethoven or whatever it is and that's work. Then you look up, so Gateways is a music festival of, for classical musicians of African descent. And you look up and you're on stage with all black musicians and uh, it's mind-blowing the first time. 
right? And so on the way home, I definitely had some real introspection about what have I come to think of as normal, such that seeing myself reflected around this stage is mind-blowing to me. And what behaviors have I learned? And whose feelings am I trying to protect? And all of that. So there was some feelings of threat or danger. And I had, it, but over time, I realized that those were just feelings. And, um, and that was a learned thing. Uh, any responses from, from the panel? I would actually like, so in a, in a previous uh, session, I would love for Justin to talk about persuasion versus power and that construct. Okay. Sorry, uh, just uh, please. Like on the spot. No, no. Um, I, I guess in an earlier discussion, we were just um, uh, talking about, you know, in terms of changing some of the institutions, you know, is it about making better cases or is it about the power to, to actually have some kind of different, um, different authority that is not about persuading? It, to me, what the interesting question is about the, the uh, I'm interested about the union and the union relationship to this issue um, and what the self interest of the union would be. Um, around this topic, and again, I don't know a lot about it, but it seems to me that that is um, one of the places that, that I never hear mentioned. Like, I just don't hear where are the unions on this question, because that they have an amount of power that it seems to me management and where I come from, philanthropy, somewhat fears. Um, that if the, if the union gets angry, you know, the whole thing could shut down. And, and when, when the unions have this clash with management, um, they, you know, whole cities become like the national conversation, right? So in Pittsburgh, we hear about Detroit, or last time I was talking to someone in Minnesota. So I, I guess I have a question back, which is on the question of power. Like, where are unions on this issue? Well, I mean, I, I guess that's, that comes to me, doesn't it? Um, you know, unions historically are social justice organizations. And, you know, part of what drives unions is the struggle for equity and for um, justice for our members. So, uh, you know, I think certainly the AFM at this point is extremely interested in this question, interested in seeing um, a, a real investment in diversity and in inclusion and working together. But, but it's, uh, you know, the problem we face is that this is not something, again, that we can legislate from above. And so we have to get buy-in from our members and from the musicians in our orchestras. And we have to have willing partners. We have to have administrations and boards that we can work with to make these things happen. And I've, I've seen some interesting conversations over the last couple of days, um, which suggest to me that we're reaching a point now where there is that kind of buy-in from everybody who's sitting around the table and that maybe we're at a moment where unions and administrations and boards can work together to really affect a kind of change that we have not yet been able to do. Could I just really quickly add a piece of this puzzle that has sort of come <laughs> to our narrative. conversations this week? Um, we do have contracts that we've negotiated what that outline audition yeah. procedures, but there are maybe three contracts in Ixom orchestras where players can actually override the music director and the music director is completely absent from our conversations, like, everywhere. They're the ones that make the decision about who gets hired. We approve, you know, we say, yes, you can hire this person, but they make the decision and they make the tenure decision. So I just want to add that to the... Can I just say right there, like, that's the issue that was raised about black women, right, right there? Unless, yeah, because unless you were in line, right, and she's there to speak, Right? It's like, we, what's the purpose of having these discussions if we can't see those small little details? Well, I, I beg your pardon for doing that, but I just wanted to add on to the union. It, yeah, yeah, you could just say, my bad. I'm sorry, my there bad. There you go, there you go, yeah. Go ahead. Jessica, go ahead. Um, I'm actually, I'm not glad that that happened, but I think it's very effective because as a freelance musician and contractor, this is the reality of what I experience in the city of New York all the time. I don't have tenure. I'm not in a salary position. Mm -hmm. I did play with um, the Charlotte Symphony for two years before I entered grad school. And I only did that because I just really needed the money and there wasn't anything else to do in Charlotte. Um, when I first started studying violin, I loved orchestra. It was always my first love. But apathy has destroyed that love and that apathy comes from not seeing us represented in repertoire, 
composers, audition lists, I'm over it. Mm. And I know I have most of my colleagues that I work with frequently are also over it. And so I'm a person that straddles pretty much 50% the classical and pop worlds. And I right now feel much more comfortable in the pop world because I work with high profile artists who are able to say, NBC needs to have a quartet of black players on TV on Fallon. That's just common. That's what he asked for. Questlove, that's what he asked for. They are overjoyed to see us there in that space with classical training, playing pop music. But the one thing that I've experienced with these diversity initiatives and measures and get togethers and thinks and gateways is that while I'm there, I feel great. When I leave, mm. it's like back to real life because it has been the same thing for years and years and years. And so I think the one thing that I wish we could do more of is be belligerent in, in claiming our space. Mm. So what would you say to musicians who are extremely apathetic? Because if you know me, you know I'm pretty belligerent anyway. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I had something to lose, I wouldn't care. Um, but I found that we don't have a Serena and we don't have a Misty Copeland. Mm. And working in such a diverse field and working with so many different types of arts disciplines, I have found that other arts organizations and other fields are much more strident in trying mm. to push through what you see on stage. And I, I don't know if that has to do with you know, who we are as classical musicians. I don't know if it's because we have spent so much time in the practice room that we're kind of just in there for life, I'm not sure. But what do you say for encouragement? Because in my experience, and even sometimes in these, these situations, I'm experiencing no like stigma that is no different from what I experience with my white colleagues, mm. which is another reason why I am 10 times more comfortable playing, like applying my classical training in a pop setting. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to that? Yeah, so I would say um, that uh, this is something that challenges me. You know, I spend a, a, an increasing amount of my time these days in conversations like this, doing work like this, and um, I. Uh, what is important? So and then I and then I look at this work as, like. So here I am working to solve like the problems of white institutions. Right, which don't see me, and you know, to your point about you know being in love with this thing, and this thing has not loved you back. Right, doesn't even see you. Like, doesn't even see you. Forget about not returning your calls. Like, um, so for me, uh, it's really important for me that I put a lot of my energy into the Gateways Music Festival. Right, so I put that that we can look at um, inclusion and not necessarily within the framework of diversifying or fixing white spaces, you know, what, what does it mean in terms of building networks amongst ourselves? What does it mean about building structures for ourselves? What does it mean um, in terms of having places where we don't have to struggle to be recognized or understood or explain ourselves? And so, um, and that work is important to me and uh, that's, that's, you know, and, and how can we, how, to your point about gateways and it's these, how can we turn these oases in your life into your life, right? Um, I had a conversation with Toyin Spellman, who I know from just being a kid. We both grew up around D.C. and and we talked about like what would it have been like if this, if if like a Gateways experience had been our experience the whole way through, the whole way through into the professional rank, and how would white orchestras have reacted to us if we had our own orchestras? And I don't mean, I'm not talking some, you know, but if we just had, if we were just out there, if, this, if these were full-time performing, and would they not come calling for us the way they come calling for other soloists and professionals that they want? When they want someone, when the Chicago Symphony wanted Alex Klein, they got him, right? I studied with Ricardo Morales. When he's wanted, they get him, you know what I'm saying? So they, and if we maybe, so work on building our own, our own platforms and our own ways of highlighting and validating and understanding and exploring ourselves um, and exploring this music in that context. You know, I, I, I know that I have at some point in my life said something to the effect of, um, you know, I don't want to be known as a black clarinetist. I want to be known as, that's bogus, man. For me personally, at this point in my life, I am a black clarinetist, right? And I want to be known as my first self at all times. Right? Um, 
I don't know if we're going to get to our section, sec second section. So that why don't we okay do this? Though. Why don't we? It might be okay though. Yeah. We might be okay. Why don't we do this? Rather than uh, let's take two minutes here and let's just watch the video that framed our outside looking in, and then we're going to talk to the room some more. So uh, we did. We talked about outside looking in, and this is what we thought and looked at. Justice for us all. Justice for my crown is justice for us all. Which side are you on, friend? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, friend? Which side are you on? Justice for my crown is justice for us all. Justice for my crown is justice for us all. So for those of you who don't know, sure, please. That was um, the St. Louis Symphony did a performance of Brahms' German Requiem and some ticket holding artist protesters um, before the second half started stood up and performed that, which is called the Requiem for Mike Brown. They sang that song, Which Side Are You On? And that framed our, con our conversation uh, before this panel about outside looking, but the room was speaking, so I'm, I, I don't think, you know, no. let's, let's hear I'll from the room some more. Oh, Anna, I, you should I, say something. Yeah, I, I actually, apologize. And there was a question about what are, what are administrators or management doing about dismantling the, you know, the white supremacy, that structure, and um, I will just recount from, my, because I, I worked at the St. Louis Symphony at that time, and I think, you know, I think, again, coming down to symbolism, because when you think about culturally, the St. Louis Symphony is an amazing orchestra in terms of being very welcoming and inclusive. It's a, a really great community. Um, and in terms of quantitatively, they do a ton of community and, and really impressive amount of community engagement. But symbolically, the protesters felt that the orchestra was not inclusive, right? I mean, that's why they, they chose the orchestra to do that. Right, they say that themselves. They were looking, they, they came to Symphony Hall because they were looking for people who were fence sitters, who believed that this issue in Ferguson didn't relate to them, and their feeling was they knew they could find those people in the Symphony Hall. And to your point, Anna, I think yeah. that's what we symbolize, yeah. right? We symbolize sort of aloof, aloof yeah. white, elite yeah. wealth. Yeah. But please, go ahead. And so I just want to say that what we did not do was come out with a, a statement about social Justice. I was, I, and but I do not fault at all my colleagues, or I was in, involved there, of with not having made that speaking truth to power. We didn't do that. But in hindsight, um, I think that there. Are th I, as, as I think about it now, we could have done something more incremental. I mean, we did some things. We reacted, I think, in a in a very good good way. Um, but there are things that we could have done more. We didn't, at that point, we were in between leadership, so we didn't have a brave, brave and intrepid spokesperson, brave leader who could come out with, was making a statement to really put wings under that, mm -hmm. that um, the requiem. And we did, but we, and we also didn't have a, a big donor or someone come to us and say, you guys, you guys gotta react to this in this way. And so I think those, 
where when somebody talks about what can the administration do, those, those are some things in my, mm -hmm. in my head. We have a gentleman, we have some people at the microphone. So we'll do this side. And, you know, in, in the interest of time, how about we just take the questions and then, we'll, and then, then we can process them and, and get some more in. So go ahead. She, she was actually up there. Oh, first. fair enough. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hi, I'm a little short. Um, my name is Gabrielle Skinner. Um, I have a question that I've actually heard a couple times through the last five days that I've been here, and I just really feel like it hasn't quite been addressed. Um, and it's this concept with the diversity fellowships, and as a diversity fellowship from two organizations at the moment, moment I'm so grateful for the, for the support that I've gotten and that they're available. But I still haven't heard an answer to what we're doing for the current members of these orchestras and organizations, are, like training for them to accept us instead of us being some sort of token, mm -hmm. like, hey, we got money and we're gonna have pictures of you on our brochure. Mm -hmm. Great, I'm sorry, let's get this, because uh, we're in our last five minutes, so I want to get as much from the room as possible, and then we'll, we'll process. So my thing is more about the visibility. Um, one of the things that I've also noticed is that when I do see uh, African Americans or any other brown folks playing classical music, it's often on the late night show or something like that, but I see that on Venmo, I see it on YouTube, I see it on everything. But then when I look up, you know, Brahms too, and it pops up on, on YouTube, it's just always like mm -hmm. an orchestra that's predominantly white people. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, if you guys think that it would probably also be in our best interest to really saturate the internet and uh, the, the visibility, because you have the ability to bypass NBC, you mm -hmm. have the ability to bypass all of these other major organizations by just going straight to mm -hmm. the internet, which is where a lot of young people mm -hmm. consume uh, a lot of their cultural uh, understanding and cultural norms. So I just keep thinking, you know, I've seen all these artists and everybody playing all this music. It's been, a, I've had a wonderful time here. And then right when I go out the door, you know, I'm gonna look online, but I really have to like mm -hmm. search to search seek to it out. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you guys think it would be a, a, a good idea to really kind of saturate mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the entire internet with, with, you know, people mm -hmm. of color playing music. Cause then, okay. it, then it becomes accepted as a norm. Okay, all right, we'll process that. Uh, let's do, we'll do this. We'll just go back and forth. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna run out of time. So let's just, okay. let's just take a couple more. And okay, yes. well I was just gonna make a statement as a black, as a black woman in yep. classical music. Um, and I just wanna say that I'm hopeful. Uh, and um, you know, MLK talked about uh, classical music being the bastion of elitism, the last bastion of elitism. And um, I think so it's gonna be a struggle, naturally. I'm on the Regional Orchestra Players Association Executive Board. And that just happened in the past few years, and it was because of someone, you know, in, in a very, uh, the president actually at the time, encouraging me, you know, to take on that position, and then encouragement for, uh, from other people on the board for me to take on this position, and believing, you know, that I, I could make a difference, et cetera. So um, I think there's a lot happening. Regional Orchestra Players Association is like a liaison between the uh, orchestra members of regional orchestras and the union. Mm -hmm the AFM, American Federation of Musicians. So I think that, that things are changing and um, there's, there's the conversation is happening. Uh, musicians in general have a specific set of ideas that are prevalent in classical music, in the classical music world, so it's just gonna be a struggle naturally. And I just wanna say that the conversation is happening, the fact that Rochelle is on stage right now here and speaking in this manner is huge. The AFM is listening and adapting. This is gonna take time. Some will come around faster than others, but for some people, it will just take a little bit more time, but it's happening. Okay. We're gonna take one more from here, and then we're gonna, I, I need to hear from the panel. Oh, please, yes. I just wanted to thank Justin for creating a learning moment for us when that interruption and budding in line thing happened, and it was a great calling in moment, like we didn't have to shut her down, but hey, next time just say my bad, right? So thank you for doing that. But from that experience, like what if Rochelle had been the person who had called her out, right? Um, how can like white women call out white women? And not, not a criticism at all, Rochelle, you're amazing. But um, just like the dynamics, right, of who decides to call out or call in their colleagues and that's what contributes to a, any workspace or any environment they're in to, uh, to create an exclusive or unwelcoming white supremacist culture. And how can we in the orchestra world or classical music world create a space where we all feel comfortable calling each other out or calling mm -hmm. each other in, right? So that we feel like we can all learn, but like don't let stuff pass by. So 
what are we doing to, to help each other and, and call those things out more often? Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to get some, we have a minute 30, so I'd like to get some final thoughts, thoughts from the panel, um, and then uh, uh, we're going to stick around and be available, and we'll keep the conversation going as best we can, as long as they'll let us hold the room, or we'll spill out into the, into the ante room there. But go ahead, Wesley. I want to answer your question, because I can empathize with the frustration of having asked something five times and not gotten an answer. Um, I think that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, about there being training and development and professional development for orchestra musicians so that people understand what's happening, whether or not that's, that's harassment training, cultural sensitivity training, implicit bias training, et cetera, et cetera. Those things need to happen, and those things need to appear in the budget of those orchestras. Mm -hmm. And real quickly, one more thing to the, the lady who was just at the microphone right here. I think what you're saying is right on. And what, what you made me think of, and also watching that Michael Brown video made me think of, is the idea that we all need to remember that racism and systemic oppression in this country, or at least fighting it, has never been an issue of black versus white. It's always been an issue of black and white versus white. And so what that means is that people like yourself need to feel empowered to say those things. You know, it's, our, it's always been our paradigm that we look to someone like Justin and say like, you gonna say something? It's like, it's okay. It's okay for you to say something. And it's also okay for him to encourage you to say something so that we can start to create that dynamic. Anyone else have in our final seconds here? Um, may I just uh, ask a quick question? And we, we, uh, okay. You don't, you don't need to answer it, but just sure. to, to okay. hang it up. Um, I'm a cellist uh, based in Boston, a freelancer and, and, and teacher. And um, um, although, of course, uh, full time professional orchestras are, are, are um, all around the country and they are a great part of, of, the, of, the, of the work, uh, opportunities for musicians. There are a number of smaller groups that also work with uh, the local uni unions, and, um, and and there are a lot of freelancers that are part important part of the ecosystem of of, the, of live music. I like it. I'm sure it's the case for for many musicians throughout the country. I'm often the the only musician of color in a given group, and I feel that um, the only reason that I have work is because I have made it undeniable that I am the best when I present, uh, do an audition. Um, but then um, my question is for Rochelle. Um, uh, what can the uh, AFM do um, to encourage the local union and contractors to be aware of the of of this issue because I th I feel like a lot of contractors, some of them are part of their uh, they have leadership positions at the local unions. Um, they have a lot in their power to to contract the musicians in the orchestras, and I'm wondering what can be done. So, Thank so you. being sensitive to the fact that we are out of time, I would and and sensitive to the fact that as a union we respond to our members. I would turn it back to you and ask you, what do you think we should be doing? Sure. And let's have that conversation you know, in the hall or outside the room. But I, I think what I want to do is to hear from you as to what you think the AFM could be doing to be more supportive. So we are out of time. On behalf of the uh, Institutional Readiness Task Force, which is working on the very issues that the, the young woman, or I don't know how young you are, but it appeared young to me. I apologize. Um, <laughs> Uh, the fellow, we're working on these issues, right? And this, uh, how do we make our institutions ready for success uh, in terms of recruiting um, the, the musicians that we need and want in our ensembles? And I'd be interested to talk to you afterwards about what ideas you have around that. If you, we are so grateful to the room. Uh, this is really informing our work. And uh, I think all of us are grateful to this amazing panel. If you could join me in giving them a Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much.